Okay, everybody, I am going to um, lecture on Chapter 7, Roman Art, last chapter before our midterm. And I have uh, uploaded a uh, review sheet for you, so you should have all that information and get ready to go. Uh, again, I'm going to open the test next Wednesday, and it will be open until Sunday at midnight. All right, so we are going to talk about Roman Art. We are, of course, in Italy now uh, and uh, around Rome, but soon the Roman Empire will expand all the way to uh, North Africa Spain, and Spain. So the Roman Republic is the first time period we look at. The Romans overthrow the last Etruscan king, Tarquinius Superbus. They've had enough of the kings. They're very corrupt and do not rule in a very humane way. So the Romans... Um, rise up and get rid of the uh, Etruscans. And that is the decline of the Etruscans who, um, as we saw in the last chapter, become Roman citizens. A constitutional government is established, and this is a little bit or more like ours than the democracy, actually. Uh, we are a republic. We have a constitutional government. And we uh, they have a, a senate with elected consuls, and these have to be elders. So this is um, different than the Greeks. So we're gonna see this, um, this acceptance of uh, the older generations. And when needed, um, the Roman Republic may have a dictator, and turns out it does need it several times um, with the uh, Caesars and the Augustuses. The first republics, republics were uh, wealthy landowners and patricians. So this is not, um, you know, an equal society. Everybody has their uh, place. Before long, Rome conquered all of its neighbors one by one. And thus uh, the Roman Empire spreads, as does the Roman style. So we look first at the Temple of Pertunus. Hopefully uh, you can see that there is a heavy and Etruscan influence. There is a front portico, a porch, and then a back, a solid structure with rooms. It has an axial uh, symmetry here. You can go up the stairs. It has an axis, um, and it has a faux peristyle, right? Uh, it does not have columns all around it. It has these what we call engaged columns, so a uh, half column sort of stuck to a building. They are not supporting structures. They are there just um, to look Greek. And uh, this is an ionic um, capital on this building. So we have an influence of both Greek and Etruscans in the architecture of early Rome. So the porch, ionic columns, there's a pediment, still no sculptural programs frontal axis, and gauged columns. Um, the turning point for Roman art is when um, they defeat the Greeks in Syracuse, and they bring back all kinds of Greek goods, um, and exposure to Greek art increases as Romans expand their conquest. And Greece itself eventually becomes a Roman conquest and thus begins the love affair with Greek art. Uh, still with a heavy Etruscan influence as well, but Romans will start to really um, copy a lot of things from the, the Greeks. This is the Temple of Vesta. It is a round temple. Like the, um, there was a, um, a round temple at Epidaurus where we saw the uh, theater. This is a tholos if it were Greek, but the um, Romans are basing um, this off of uh, what they would have seen. But the new thing is, if you can see this material here, is that the Romans find a way to use this new thing called concrete, and this will revolutionize architecture. So these have um, Corinthian capitals with bulls on them. But really, we look at this as one of the first instances we can say um, that Romans start using concrete, and then we'll see many, many, many later structures. In fact, we still use concrete. So this is the sanctuary of Fortuna and Primogenia. And this is all made possible because of concrete. Uh, this looks a lot like um, Queen Hatshepsut's 
temple, uh, except um, that temple had to use the mountain to sort of build into it for height um, and to get all these um, terraces. But with concrete, you can build up off of the land without having to rely on the land to help you. So this, this is revolutionary. You can get great height and uh, space, span a lot of area without worrying about what the landscape around is. You can uh, work over it. Right, so you see all these terraces. We have all these colonnades. Um, arches, which will be um, another new building construction or building technique. Many ramps. It's a lot like a head chip suit. And so these are some of the things that concrete makes possible. A barrel vault, a groin vault. Um, these long uh, areas that, that span um, quite a distance with concrete, and then you can also make round structures and domed things, which we'll see at the end of the chapter. This particular one, the fenestrated sequence here, um, is very important to look at because the Gothic architecture, or Romanesque and Gothic architecture, will be directly based on this building process right here that the Romans invent. As far as portraiture in the early Republic, we have a man with portrait busts here with his ancestors. Um, he is toga clad and shows his ancestors. This was a thing in ancient Rome to uh, make, make uh, either portrait busts or wax masks of the deceased. And the, the wax mask would actually use the deceased's face. And then that would be cast in plaster. And people would, uh, wealthy people would um, take these and um, parade around in them. Uh, at other people's funerals, so proud of their own heritage, right? But when we look at this, we can see quite a difference in um, what the faces look like, right? These are very, uh, these are older people. They are stern looking. They don't look happy. And we're going to have a word for that soon. So Roman death port or death mass. So there's this importance placed on genealogy. And we also have this idea of uh, age suddenly being portrayed in art. We saw the seer and the old market woman in the last chapter. But the Romans have another reason for doing this. And one of them is only elders held power in the Republic. So if you're a wealthy, older person, you are probably a powerful person in, uh, in Rome. So this is the head of a Republican priest, and we're going to call this style veristic, meaning super real. It's also called like warts and all. You see every craggly wrinkle in this man's face, like right here, you see this thing. Um, all right, his jowl, his sort of like sour look on his face. So these were qualities of strength. You were like a stern and serious person. And the Romans believed that a head alone is a portrait. Just, just your head represents you, no matter what you do to the rest of the sculpture, including something like this. So this is a portrait of a Roman general. And you can see this is a portrait of somebody's face a very good likeness to somebody. All right, we see a very specific um, look on his face. And this is not a mistake. This isn't on the wrong body. This is the way the sculptor made it. He is uh, a, an older man with the head of a young, or the an head of an older man and the body of a young man. So the bottom part is a direct quotation. If he had his leg, there still, he has this little thing helping him out now. Um, he would be in contrapposto, almost like the S curve of Praxiteles. Um, and you would know it was not Greek because of the old face and then his toga. So we have a veristic portrait on top of an idealized Greek body. So the Romans are OK with sort of picking and choosing and sticking things together. Um, just like they did with the temple. 
take an Etruscan temple and stick some Greek stuff on it and we'll call it Roman. So they're okay with like these composite styles. And this ultimately makes it distinctly Roman. And we have this sensibility too. If you stick some columns in front of something like you all wrote on your papers in an institution like a bank or uh, a place of education, it immediately gives you some kind of um, cultural leg up or cultural cachet. It gives you class, thus the word classicism. All right, the uh, Romans did use coins for money uh, and mostly they would have gods on their money. Um, but Julius Caesar took it upon himself to put his own face on a denarius. And a denarius is uh, what we, uh, now we get that word uh, meaning penny. But at the time it was a silver coin that was worth 10 mules. And this was sort of scandalous or blasphemous for Julius Caesar to do this. Um, and this was actually, he did this shortly before um, he was uh, assassinated. And after he did this, many uh, rulers um, used their portraits around the uh, empire so that people who would not have access to you or know what you look like would know who you were. So it's sort of reaching out to your people in a way, but we can consider it sort of political propaganda. And so we sort of, we put our own uh, leaders uh, on, a, uh, on coins and bills as well. All right, I'm sure you know the story of Pompeii and uh, possibly it was 79, but possibly August 24th. Um, Pompeii or Mount Vesuvius erupts and it takes about 24 hours until the whole place is buried in ash and almost every single person dies. There are accounts of this um, from afar. As a matter of fact, um, Pliny the Younger is the nephew of Pliny the Elder and uh, Pliny the Elder dies in the uh, in volcanic ash and his nephew is one of the accounts um, writing down what he saw happen. Um, and he's the one who actually gives the date of August 24th. So here we see, uh, you know, the, it's bad news for them, but uh, they obviously they wouldn't be around anymore anyway, but really good news for art history because it's like a time capsule. Everything is totally frozen. So we have all of the houses and the forums and the, um, the amphitheater, everything is as it was during um, 79 CE. So we have a forum here, which is the city center. And then we have the um, main temple would be right here. And a basilica, which is a court of law, uh, is over here. And basilicas will become something else in the near future. And so it's graphic. If you, if you Google these, there's some like pretty horrific images. These are two very tame ones. Uh, but everybody was frozen in time. Um, it didn't take that long for this to happen. There's an, uh, a recent volcano happening in uh, Spain right now, and it seems to be taking a while, but um, this, this happened very quickly. So uh, this is uh, in Pompeii, this is an amphitheater. And I bet that looks familiar to it, like a stadium. All right, so amphitheater literally means double theater. And we saw the theater at Epidaurus. This is two of them stuck together. But same thing, we have the seating, we have the aisles, we have the center where the show would be. Um, amphitheaters were uh, funded by wealthy magistrates or wealthy people were often sort of pressured in ancient Rome to give their money to giant building projects. And in turn, of course, they would get special treatment. So, um, this one could hold up to 20,000 spectators. Donors would have uh, reserved choice seats. We would call them uh, box seats now. 
season ticket holders, I guess. And seating was based on status so that when you went, you could see who was who by where they were sitting. This is a fresco um, in Pompeii uh, made of the amphitheater, but it's a brawl in the, in the amphitheater is the uh, subject. And so it's uh, like after a gladiator fight, other brawls break out. You know, the, if you train people to fight, I guess they're going to fight on their own as well. But you see here the giant ramp. So it's two staircases here for crowd control so people can get in and out quicker. And then there's also um, uh, a valerium, which is, uh, here it is, the, uh, the cover that would have been pulled over the, um, the stadium or the amphitheater. And this, uh, we'll see this at the Coliseum too. Well, we won't see it, but it's there. Um, so they have some uh, engineering other than just concrete. They're perfecting their uh, building and engineering things. Uh, the other thing about Pompeii is everything is frozen in domestic situations. So we have whole houses with all everything that was in them and all the paintings that were on the wall. We don't have a lot of paintings up until now. We saw the palace at Knossos has its paintings, but we don't have a, we hardly have many uh, Greek paintings. So here we have Roman paintings. So this is a typical house, which would have an atrium here, and this would have an opening you can see here. So the rainwater could come in. And then this is a peristyle, like a little courtyard in your house. And then all the rooms, the domestic rooms. And this is what the uh, peristyle on the right would look like. And this is an atrium here on the left. So they're finding a way to sort of manipulate the architecture so they can have water and they'll, they'll find many ways to get water to, to places soon. Uh, we see four different types of uh, wall painting. This is the first style. So we're going to call them all styles, first, second, third, and fourth style. And they, do just what architecture and uh, sculpture has been doing. They go from very simple to a lot more decorative and elaborate. So this is the first style that is very um, sort of basic, but the Romans had this idea that they should decorate their walls and their homes, uh, much like we have those ideas. So in order to save money on some materials, they would like do faux stone and textures on their walls. Okay, so these are just simply supposed to be like marble and stuff like that. The second style wall painting is much more like we would think of as murals, where artists would try to um, create a fake space, like an outdoor space, or um, you know, a window with fish or something. So it's it's sort of like bringing the uh, uh, outdoors indoors. So these natural murals. The third style of Roman painting is um, sort of a combination of things. It's uh, faux architecture and frames with what we might call, you know, paintings or pictures inside of them. And they would be stacked up um, higher and higher, which is later what museums would do. Um, they'll display paintings a lot like this. And we're going to concentrate on this, the fourth style painting which may be very well one of the first still life paintings that we have anyway. And this is called trompe l'oeil um, or the technique that it's painted. Um, trompe l'oeil is a painting that's meant to trick the eye so that when you're looking at this, you s would see um, a shelf and this would be painted on a wall in a place where it belonged, like the kitchen. And you would see peaches on a shelf and then this glass. Um, so we have artists have a desire for 3D representation on a 2D surface. Now this isn't super realistic. You probably wouldn't be fooled by it, but it is pretty advanced. If you look at this glass with the reflection and this outline and the artist knows how to make all this value. You, this is casting a shadow on this and this casts a shadow here. And we see the delineation between this shelf and this going downward. So the artist, and this is very advanced, right? So the artist knows how to create um, value in painting. 
back to sculpture. This is the Augustus Prima Porta. Um, and he is shown as a general. Augustus uh, is the ruler. Um, he's the equivalent of Pericles. He rules at the golden age of uh, Rome. It is um, during a time of peace, which he helps to bring about. Um, he's the first commander in chief of the Roman Empire. The Senate is uh, the group that uh, titles him Augustus. And um, that is the beginning of the Roman Empire. Um, and with peace comes pros prosperity. Um, this, uh, this Augustus piece is called the Pax Romana, and it lasts for over two centuries. So during this time, um, there is a lot of building that goes on. If you don't have to um, spend all your money and time uh, fighting your enemies, um, you may uh, have more time to have building projects. So this sculpture shows uh, Augustus in the sign of oration, like the Arringatory, with his arm up making a speech. It shows um, sort of a realistic portrait, possibly slightly idealized, but he has a very fit muscular body. He's in contrapposto, and he has a little friend on the side there. So that's Cupid riding a dolphin. And that is in reference to the naval victory he had recently won over Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, who um, then kill themselves after they lose the battle. Um, so we did the Egyptian chapter uh, a while back, but you know they they're still going. We're just um, catching up to them. So Augustus wears this breastplate that shows gods and victory over another battle he won over the Parthians. And so we have this um, relief sculpture on top of a sculpture in the round. It's pretty elaborate. And then um, this is his, uh, his breastplate, his, his armor that he would have worn to war. Um, and this, uh, the Senate gathered money and um, built this for Augustus when he returned victorious from Spain and France. This is called the Altar of Peace or the Arapacus. And it's, it was in terrible shape. It's been reassembled. And it's in a museum now, as you can see. So there it is. You can see all the sculpture around it. It has axial, a frontal axial. And let's look at some of the sculptures here. We have this. Um, it's a female personification. And we see this woman with her drapery, reclining bag. It looks very Greek. And she almost looks like she could be on the par um, pediment of the Parthenon, one of the goddesses. But here it's a female with two babies on her lap. And she embodies the fruits of the um, Pax Augusta, the peacefulness, right? So we have, you know, the plentifulness, I guess, you know, prosperity. And all around her, the bountiful earth is in bloom. And animals of different species are all getting along. Right, so it's a, it, this is supposed to be sort of like peace personified. And um, this uh, might remind you of the procession in the Parthenon, which showed the Athenians. And this also shows specific people. In fact, some of these children are children of uh, uh, foreign kings, like dignitaries. And um, th this is sort of incredible piece because the artist in such a short space has created three levels of space. So we have these um, figures in the foreground and then the middle ground and then the background. And it's all done by how deeply the things are carved. The things that are further in the back are much more low relief than the things that are in the front. The children are almost totally three-dimensional. So these would be... Um, Romans and, and uh, peoples that would have been known. So very similar to the Parthenon in, in that um, um, people are intermingling with um, God and religion. So in some of these building projects that uh, um, continue even after Augustus is long gone, um, 
one of them is the aqueducts. The um, Romans are great at engineering, and now that they have concrete, they can do so many things, include, uh, including import water from other places. So this is the Pont du Gard in Nimes, which is in France. Um, and the, of course, the empire expands all the way to Spain and France. Um, so you see here, these are, this is the Roman arch repeated. And then we have these smaller arches up here, but it's not just decorative and it does it give some symmetry and beauty to the form, but it's also cheaper and easier and quicker if you don't use all that building material where these arches are carved out. And so this is how it would work. Um, they are tilted slightly so the direction of flow helps the water go, the uh, conduits at the top of the, um, the aqueduct. So you have the basin and lake, and then they all slowly go where they're supposed to go. So gravity helps it along. And it's said that um, the Pont de Garde could bring about 100 gallons of water a day for each inhabitant. That seems like a lot. I don't, I don't know how much I use, but I hope it's not 100. Um, of course, another uh, great building project is the Colosseum. Uh, I'm sure you know a lot about what ha what's happened in here. And the, so the, we have this amphitheater, right? Two theaters put together. But the amphitheater at Pompeii um, was not as uh, elaborate as the Colosseum because um, it uses a lot more concrete and it's a lot higher. So here, just like the aqueducts, we have these punctuations of arches, less material. And there are three orders of columns on the Colosseum. We see the Doric on the bottom the Ionic on the middle there, and Corinthian on the top. So we have Doric, Ionic, Corinthian. The inside has barrel vaults, and the, um, the whole structure is 16 stories high. That is incredibly high for this time. And this, of course, is all made possible by concrete. Um, and just to get back, the, this was entertainment for the Romans. Uh, they had the gladiator fights. They had uh, animal hunting or animal fights, animal against animal or animal against humans. And the humans were often um, indentured uh, criminals. And uh, a lot of these criminals were um, arrested because of their religion. So we have a persecution of all different religions as well um, in the Colosseum. So, um, what Romans thought was um, entertainment, we, we, we ourselves would consider totally um, criminal or barbaric. And the last thing we're going to look at in this chapter, in this lecture anyway, is the Pantheon. And the Pantheon is, uh, it's a good place to stop because where we started is very similar. We started with the uh, Roman temple the temple at Portunus. And here we see almost the same thing. We have a Greek temple front, in fact, eight columns, which is the side of the Parthenon. And these are Corinthian columns and the pediment, no sculpture in it though. And when you walk into it, it's like a portico stuck on something else. But this time around, it is stuck onto a giant drum, this circular structure here. And then you can see the dome uh, on top. So the Pantheon um, is built by Hadrian and it's his dedication to all gods. Remember pantheistic is uh, worship of all gods. So the Pantheon is dedication to all gods. And when you go through the por portico, you get into a dome that opens up and it has um, a 30 foot oculus, which is the top um, eyeball. Oculus means eye. And the oculus lets the light in and travels across the dome as the sky, uh, as the sun would travel across the sky. So it's a metaphor. Um, inside we have um, these coffers, these uh, 
um, square things and inside of them were possibly uh, bronze uh, florets almost like these would all be stars in the sky and then here you have the oculus that would travel around and then there's all these little niches that would have gods in them so dedicated to all gods so there's the portico you go in and then you would be overwhelmed by this giant space here with the light shining down on you and this is important to note because this is a, a an experience that you would have due to architecture and we're going to see churches very soon in this course that will do very similar things to uh, create an awe-inspiring um, experience by using height and light. And this is the light shining down. And that was the only light to get in, so um, it's helpful anyway. I think with the oculus and the sculptures of all that, these are all the little niches. niches. All right, so that is the last image that I will show. It's the last one on your um, your review sheet. So um, go ahead and start studying for the midterm. Again, it will open up on Wednesday, but I'll be send sending reminders for that.